Well, more speculation has been raised on the reasons for NATO's intervention in Libya. And as RT's Laura Emmett reports, the organization may have been trying to prevent Gaddafi from burying the American buck. According to some, it's about protecting civilians. We must not tolerate this regime using military force against its own people. Others say it's about oil. The only reason they're interested in, with Libya is about the oil. You'd think we'd be in Iraq if the major export there was broccoli. But some are convinced intervention in Libya is all about currency, specifically Gaddafi's plan to introduce the gold dinar, a single African currency made from gold, a true sharing of the wealth. It's one of these things that you have to plan almost in secret, because as soon as you say you're going to change over from the dollar to the something else, you're going to be targeted. There were two conferences on this, one in 96 and another one in the year 2000, called the World Mataba Conference, organized by Gaddafi. And uh, everybody was interested. I think most countries in Africa were keen. Gaddafi didn't give up. In the months leading up to the military intervention, he called on African and Muslim nations to join together to create this new currency that would rival the dollar and euro. They would sell oil and other resources around the world only for gold dinars. It's an idea that would shift the economic balance of the world. Countries' wealth would depend on how much gold they have, not how many dollars they trade. And Libya has 144 tonnes of gold. The UK has double that, but 10 times the population. But I do have one question. During the crisis or any time that you're aware of, uh, has the Federal Reserve or Treasury participated in any gold swaps arrangements? Uh, we don't, the Federal Reserve does not own any gold at all. We have not owned gold since 1934. Um, uh, we don't, the Federal Reserve does not own any gold at all. We have not owned gold since 1934. The Federal Reserve does not own any gold at all. If Gaddafi uh, had an intent to try to uh, reprice his oil or whatever else the, uh, the country was uh, selling in the global markets and accept something else as a currency or maybe launch a gold in our currency, any move such as that would certainly not be welcomed by the power elite today who are responsible for controlling the world's central banks. So yes, that would certainly be something that would cause his immediate dismissal and the need for other reasons to, uh, to be brought forth for removing him from power. It's happened before. In 2000, Saddam Hussein announced Iraqi oil would be traded in euros, not dollars. Sanctions and an invasion followed. Some say because the Americans were desperate to prevent OPEC from transferring oil trading in all its member countries to the euro. The UK's gold is kept here in a secure vault somewhere in the depths of the Bank of England. As in most developed countries, there's not enough to go around. But that's not the case in places like Libya and many of the Gulf states. A gold dinar would have given oil-rich African and Middle Eastern countries the power to turn around to their energy-hungry customers and say, sorry, the price has gone up and we want gold. Some say the US and its NATO allies literally couldn't afford to let that happen. Laura Emmett, RT, London. President Obama unequivocally putting Muammar Gaddafi on hold in a phone call. To German Chancellor Angela Merkel, the president said Gaddafi was using mass violence as his only means of staying in power, that Gaddafi had lost legitimacy, and for the first time, that Gaddafi should leave now. And late last night, the White House rolled out new sanctions against Libya, blocking bank accounts and freezing the assets of Gaddafi, his regime, and senior and, and his children. The president had held back on calling for Gaddafi to step down until U.S. citizens were safely out of the country. Today, the president intensified the pressure. Russ. Joel Brown at the White House. Well, right now, diplomats the world over are scratching their heads on how to manage the situation in Libya. And on top of sanctions, Colonel Gaddafi now faces the possibility of a no-fly zone over his country. British Prime Minister David Cameron said he would work with his allies on preparations for such a plan and would not rule out the use of military assets. At the same time, the United States is also repositioning its naval and air forces around Libya. The BBC's diplomatic correspondent James Robbins is following that part of the story. 
These extraordinary pictures, apparently from the town of Misrata, suggest the scale of violence in parts of Libya as ground is fought over. These images are thought to come from the same town, as Colonel Gaddafi's regime is squeezed both by the scale of rebellion and increasing global pressure on him to give up now. First, the diplomatic pressure. In Geneva, foreign ministers focused on newly announced European Union sanctions. They're important because 85% of Libya's energy exports are to Europe. Hillary Clinton said no military action was pending, but at Westminster the Prime Minister made clear the option of enforcing a no-fly zone over Libya is being worked on. We do not in any way rule out the use of military assets. We must not tolerate this regime using military force against its own people. And in that context, I've asked the Ministry of Defence and the Chief of Defence Staff to work with our allies on plans for a military no-fly zone. Imagine what the world would be like with him in power. The idea is to try to help change the Middle East. Now look, I did, part of the reason we went into Iraq uh, was, uh, the main reason we went into Iraq at the time was we thought he had weapons of mass destruction. It turns out he didn't, but he had the capacity to make weapons of mass destruction. But I also talked about the human suffering in Iraq, and I also talked the need to advance a freedom agenda. And so my question, my answer to your question is, is that imagine a world in which Saddam Hussein was there, stirring up even more trouble in a part of the world that uh, had so much resentment, so much hatred, that, three, that, that people came and killed 3,000 of our citizens. You know, I, I've heard this theory about, you know, everything was just fine until we arrived, and, then, you know, kind of, the, the, you know, stir up the hornet's nest theory. It just, it just doesn't hold water as far as I'm concerned. The terrorists attacked us and killed 3,000 of our citizens before we started the freedom agenda in the Middle East. They were... What did Iraq have to do with what? The attack on the World Trade Center. Nothing, except for it's part of, and nobody's ever suggested in this administration that Saddam Hussein ordered the attack. We must not tolerate this regime using military force against its own people. And in that context, I've asked the Ministry of Defence and the Chief of Defence Staff to work with our allies on plans for a military no-fly zone. But reviving an Iraq-style no-fly zone and imposing it over Libya would take time. Huge questions have to be answered first. Under whose authority would it be imposed? The UN has so far ruled out backing military action in this crisis, and NATO is only in the very early stages of considering it. But financial pressure on the Gaddafi regime will build slowly but steadily. It's now estimated that 80% of Libya's oil fields are in rebel hands. Over time, Colonel Gaddafi will run out of cash. It's fundamentally important. There really is nothing else in the economy apart from oil, um, which is why I think that, that the, the international oil companies will be invited back by the, by the next regime when it takes over. The greatest pressure on Colonel Gaddafi is internal from his own people. He's lost large parts of his country to the rebellion, with the east of the country fully in opposition hands. Libya's second city, Benghazi, was the first to fall. There's been fierce fighting at Misrata, particularly to control the airbase. There are towns outside Tripoli which remain in the hands of Gaddafi loyalists, including Sirt, Colonel Gaddafi's birthplace. But the focus is still on the capital itself. Tripoli is home to around 1.7 million people out of a total population of 6.4 million. And it's still a command center for up to an estimated 10,000 armed forces thought to be loyal to Gaddafi. Libya's Colonel Muammar Gaddafi has warned that his people will fight back if world powers try to enforce a no-fly zone over the country's skies. Gaddafi told Turkey's TRT channel that the West only wanted to take action so it could seize control of Libyan oil. He also claimed that if he stepped down, it would leave a power vacuum to be filled by al-Qaeda. We are the ones preventing al-Qaeda from taking control, he said. They would drag the whole region into chaos.
was Colonel Gaddafi's first interview for Western journalists since this crisis started. He agreed to see the BBC, ABC News from the United States and the Sunday Times. He was fairly relaxed throughout the interview which was held in a restaurant overlooking Tripoli port. He said the UN sanctions resolution against Libya was illegitimate. And then he was asked if he'd ever leave the country. <laughs> As if anyone would leave their homeland, he said. In recent years, you've had uh, a rapprochement with Western countries. Uh, you've had important Western leaders like Tony Blair coming here. But now there are Western leaders who are queuing up to say that you should go. Uh, do you feel a sense of betrayal about that? Of course it's betrayal, he said. They have no moral. Mr. Gaddafi said, we didn't understand the Libyan system. No, I understand the system that you have here, but internationally, you're regarded as... You don't as understand the system here. No, no, no. Don't, don't say I understand. You don't understand. And the world don't understand the system here, the biblical system here, the authority of the people. You don't understand it. But how do the people show their authority then? Because some who've gone out onto the streets to protest say that your people have shot at them. No demonstration at all in the streets. Have you seen? Did you see demonstrations? Uh, yes, I have. Yes. Where? I saw some some today. I Where? saw some in Zawiya. Yesterday I saw demonstrations. Are they uh, supporting us? No, they're not supporting. They us. are not against us. Some some were against you and some were for. No, you. no one against us. Against me for what? Because I am not present. But, but, but they they love me. All my people with me. They love me all. But if they do love they, you, they they will die to to protect me and my my people. If you say they do love you, then why are they capturing Benghazi and they say they're against you there? Why are they in... It is a guide. It is a guide. It is a guide. Not my people. It is a guide. Al-Qaeda. A guide. A guide. Yeah. They, they came from outside. So they're the people pulling down the posters and putting up the flag of the king? It's Al-Qaeda, he said. They went into military bases and seized arms and they're terrorizing the people. The people who had the weapons were youngsters. They're starting to lay down their weapons now as the drugs Al-Qaeda gave them wear off. Even Bin Laden's displays of strength for the Western media were faked. The fighters in this video had been hired for the day and told to bring their own weapons. For beyond his own small group, Bin Laden had no formal organization until the Americans invented one for him. The picture Al Fadl drew for the Americans of Bin Laden was of an all-powerful figure at the head of a large terrorist network that had an organized hierarchy of control. He also said that Bin Laden had given this network a name, Al-Qaeda. It was a dramatic and powerful picture of Bin Laden, but it bore little relationship to the truth. The reality was that Bin Laden and Ayman Zawahiri had become the focus of a loose association of disillusioned Islamist militants who were attracted by the new strategy. There is also no evidence that Bin Laden used the term Al-Qaeda to refer to the name of a group until after September the 11th, when he realized that this was the term the Americans had given him. Anti-Gaddafi rebels freed a prison in Tripoli. Today, CNN has learned that among those liberated inmates are hundreds of men who are believed to be supporters of Al-Qaeda. They're now on the loose. The man who uncovered this story is CNN terrorism analyst Paul Cookshank. He has been to that prison in the past, joins us live from London. Paul, give us details on just who is now free in Libya. Well, what we're hearing, uh, Drew, is that up to 600 prisoners from this prison uh, are believed to be uh, pro-Al-Qaeda militants, uh, people who were imprisoned there by Gaddafi, who've been there for several years, people who were imprisoned at the height of the Iraqi insurgency. Many of these individuals, uh, it, we understand, actually tried to go to Iraq. Some of them came back from Iraq after fighting against American troops there. So there, there are rather large concerns uh, at the moment about uh, wh who these individuals are and what they may do uh, in the future.
U.S. President Barack Obama called on Muammar Gaddafi to stop the bloodshed and fighting in Libya as rebels and forces loyal to him continue to clash on Monday. Although it's clear that Gaddafi's rule is over, he still has the opportunity to reduce further bloodshed by explicitly relinquishing power to the people of Libya and calling for those forces that continue to fight to lay down their arms for the sake of Libya. While rebels search Tripoli for Gaddafi, some forces loyal to the autocratic leader fiercely continued the fight. Obama said the United States would be prepared to offer Libya support and provide humanitarian aid to the wounded. I've directed my team to be in close contact with NATO as well as the United Nations to determine other steps that we can take. To deal with the humanitarian impact, we're working to ensure that critical supplies reach those in need, particularly those who've been wounded. The U.S. President said his country will continue to be involved in the multinational effort and supports NATO's mission in the ouster of Gaddafi. We're working to ensure that critical supplies reach those in need. Now, how could all these people get such a weapon in such good condition? The rifle is not and has never been adopted by the Libyan army. Usually, Libyan soldiers run around with old Kalashnikovs, like this one. This means that the rebels could not get all of those FN, FL rifles from military storage points. And they certainly couldn't buy them in a store. So the question is, where did they get them from? And even more importantly, how could they get the enormous amounts of ammo needed for the rifles when Gaddafi didn't have them? Libya's cash-starved rebels got a much-needed boost. Nations here signing off on promises of more than a billion dollars of aid. But it's not just money the rebels want from the international community. We are asking countries to recognize the Transitional National Council as the legitimate and sole representative of the Libyan people. As you can see, these are U.S. machine guns chambered for NATO rounds. And again, they're absolutely brand new, right out of the box. Normally, machine guns don't come with their own instructors to teach you how to use them. Libya's cash-starved rebels got a much-needed boost. Nations here signing off on promises of more than a billion dollars of aid. But then again, machine guns alone don't win a revolution. You need something with some real firepower. And well, here's something. This is an MP-80S Man Portable Air Defense System. Each one of these costs big money on the black market and requires a qualified professional to maintain them. And so that's why we can see an instructor here. The guy teaching the Libyans to manage this high-tech device sure doesn't look like one of them, does he? And here we can see a joker running around with a U.S. Army pistol and a NATO Kevlar combat helmet. Now how could he get all this? From Gaddafi's military storage? Come on. Okay, this crate is American and brand new. I think you can realize that by now. Well, we can see a lot of brand new NATO weapons. Foreign instructors, American ammo, new uniforms and equipment, and a uh, suspiciously large amount of non-Libyan mugs. Do you know what this looks like? You're absolutely right. It definitely looks like a well-organized coup from abroad. The foreign managers have brought the people provided the brand new weapons, instructors, and equipment, all to the young people in Libya. Naive young people who work for free drugs, dope, and just the rush of being a revolutionary. Nobody even knows who the uh, rebels represent. And there's good evidence that the Al-Qaeda is there. So we may be delivering Al-Qaeda another prize. They'll be in Libya. They weren't there before. And also, the Al-Qaeda is in Iraq now. So these unintended consequences of our foreign policy are so overwhelming. Logic tells us uh, that we shouldn't be dealing with our foreign policy in this manner. We should be dealing for national security and defense of our country and not pretending that we can pick the dictators around the world. It's been very unsuccessful and American people are waking up to this. Nobody even knows who the uh, rebels represent. And there's good evidence that the Al-Qaeda is there. So we may be delivering Al-Qaeda another prize. They'll be in Libya. They weren't there before. Promises of the great society. 
have been shot down on the battlefield of Vietnam, making the poor, white and Negro, bear the heaviest burdens both at the front and at home. Other civil rights leaders, for various reasons, refuse or can't take a stand or have to go along with the administration. That's their business. But I'm a clear that. That I know that justice is indivisible. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. We invited the uh, foreign media to come to Tripoli and to Libya and to see and to watch and to send their reports to their channels. We noticed that the administration or management of their channels uh, selected what they want from these reports and eliminate or delay what, they, what does not serve their purposes. Which is why people here are angry. Mohammed's taken a few days off from his work as an engineer to join the throngs of Gaddafi supporters in downtown Green Square. They're hiding this. They're hiding this. Well, what's, what's going on now, okay? All the people are here, just, of course, yes, just to be supportive for our leader, Muammar Gaddafi, okay? And they want to hide this. But, say analysts, it's not just what's being hidden, it's also what's actually being said. What we're getting is a pro-U.S., pro-Pentagon, one-sided picture of a, a situation which fills the media with the idea that there's freedom fighters involved in Libya and that there's a government regime that's been an, an atrocious terrorist government for the last, since 1970, roughly. This is nonsense. Here, the Jazeera, you say I'm not in Tripoli, maybe I'm in Afghanistan, maybe I'm in Iraq. The war is clearly not in Tripoli. And just as clearly, Western media has been a little too quick to write off Gaddafi. Paulus RT, Tripoli. The coalition said destroying Gaddafi was not their goal. Then why bomb his palaces? Now some officials have claimed that eliminating him was in fact their goal. Who gave them that right? Did he have a fair trial? Returning to the no-fly zone, the bombings are destroying the country's entire infrastructure. When the so-called civilized world uses all its military power against a small country, destroying what's been created by generations, I don't know if that's good. Oh, 
يسمع الحق في ما في شنقة صدام حسين كيف يصير حرب يسقط؟ لا تكلموا عن سياسة صدام حسين والخلاف مع السياسة مو كل مختلفين سياسيين مختلفين حتى مع بعضنا نحن الآن قيادة عربية بالكامل تقدر تشنق في المشانق ما عند فرج لماذا؟ ما ممكن الدور جاي عليكم كلكم أمريكا قاتلت مع صدام حسين ضد الخميني كان صديقها تشيني كان صديق لصدام حسين رامي سلي كان وزير دفاع الأمريكا لما كان يدمروا في العراق صديق حميم لصدام حسين وأخيرا باعوا وشنقوا حتى أنتم أصدقاء أمريكا نحن أصدقاء أمريكا بلاش نقول أنتم نحن أصدقاء أمريكا كلنا قد توافق أمريكا على شنقنا في يوم ما إحنا شو بالأسف الشديد إحنا عدا بعضنا كلنا نكره بعضنا ونتخاصم مع بعضنا ونكيد لبعضنا ونشمت في بعضنا ونتآمر على بعضنا احنا مخابراتنا التآمر على بعضنا ما ما تحمي فينا من العدو نحن عدو لبعض عدو العربي صديق للعربي الاخر هل المقاعد الدامية الدائمة هل نحن متساويين فيها؟ ابدا غير متساويين من بر الخطابة فقط زي ما تخطب في حديقة Gaddafi upstaged Obama's 40-minute speech by speaking for an hour and a half, delivering a scathing attack from the podium against the world body. It was as if fireworks went off. Seriously, what he said was that um, the UN, the world body, has failed to intervene or prevent 65 wars since the inception of the UN in 1945. Now, as Gaddafi spoke from the podium, he was, podium, he was holding uh, a copy of the UN Charter in his hands, waving it ferociously, and he was saying that this, the UN right now is not a de democratic institution because it's really the Security Council that holds the power, particularly five veto-wielding members of the Security Council that hold the power. He said that the power needs to be held by the General Assembly. He said that's what would make this international body more democratic. And what he said that actually shocked everybody that was watching his speech was that the Security Council should instead be called the Terrorism Council. And we should not accept any resolution taken by the Security Council according to its uh, composition right now. We, we, we were under trusteeship, we were analyzed, we are independent, and now we are here to decide the future of the world in a democratic way that will maintain world and peace security. All people, small and big, are, are equal. This is terrorism, like the terrorism of the Qaeda. This is uh, terrorism. This is in full contradictions and full intervention of the United Nations charters, and we signed that. And, uh, Unless we do things uh, in the Charter of uh, the United Nations according which we agreed, otherwise we, we, sh we, we don't uh, speak diplomatically, we are not afraid, we are not coveting, and uh, we were not being nice to anybody. Well, now we are talking about the future of the... There is no, no hypocrisy, no diplom diplomacy, because it is a decisive and important vital matter. Of understanding and uh, hypocrisy created to 65 votes after the establishment of the United Nations. For 41 years in charge and in control, apart from a few royals, Muammar Gaddafi held power longer than anyone else anywhere else. Even in the last few days, his country facing attacks from an international alliance, he was full of bravado, full of contempt for those who sought to end what he saw as a glorious rule to be hailed forever. If Tripoli was to burn, like Baghdad did, why? Why, why, why would you allow for this to happen? How can you let Tripoli, which was beautiful and safe, how can you allow for it to be a place of destruction and uh, be set alight? This should not happen. This must not happen.
And joining us to talk more about the CIA's possible role in Libya from Washington, former CIA counterterrorism analyst Michael Scheuer. Michael, thanks for being with us this morning. You're welcome. So there are reports out, again, that the CIA is on the ground in Libya, uh, contacting and vetting the rebels. Is this setting the stage to arm them? I, I don't think there's any other uh, possible reason for it. And, and uh, the president clearly has sent the agency in to find out who he is supporting and to see what kind of material, uh, human material, we would have to work with if we decided to, if the president decided to arm and train these people over the longer term. Yeah, and you're concerned about this prospect. You think it could become another Taliban situation for the U.S. What, in your mind, is the worst case scenario here? Well, uh, Libya has been very strong in sending young men or having its young men go overseas to fight in Islamic insurgencies in the Balkans, in Chechnya, Afghanistan, especially Iraq, when the the height of the fighting was there. Those that don't get killed, of course, go home. And I think the core of the resistance, whatever little military activity, military ability they have, is probably made up by people we elsewhere we would call mujahideen. And so it's a, it's a dicey proposition to be getting involved with this. I'm not sure that uh, the opposition, if it takes power, is going to be much better than was Gaddafi. But that's why you need to have the CIA, I presume, in there vetting, as we said, who, who are these people, who are the elements that are funding them or supporting them, who are the, the politically the most, uh, the most palatable and the least palatable among them. The White House saying that no decision has been made. I have a question for you as a, as a CIA veteran, I guess. I mean, the fact that we even know about this, is that, is that unusual? I mean, should we just assume that the CIA in this sort of a situation would of course be in there on the ground? What's the alternative um, if we don't arm the rebels and they're clearly outmanned and outgunned by uh, Gaddafi's forces? Um, what's the better solution here? The better solution was, as Mr. Paul said, never go at all. This was none of our business. But I think what we're seeing is the string is playing out. We threatened Gaddafi and that didn't work. There's an arms embargo and an economic embargo. That didn't work. There was a UN resolution and that didn't work. Aerial bombing has continued and has impact, but it hasn't defeated him. Now we're at the stage where we're going to try to, apparently try to train and arm the resistance. That takes a long time. I don't know if we have that time against Gaddafi. What, what we're seeing is the president being put, putting himself into a corner where his only option is ground troops. But that's something that is not, that's not something that no one says that they want to do in this administration. I mean, they, they simply don't want to do that. They want Well, to they don't. Well, the, the, the choice may come down to admitting that it was a mistake and being defeated in the sense that Gaddafi survives or putting ground troops in. Nations are a lot like people. They don't like making, uh, admitting to mistakes. And uh, maybe they don't want to put them in. But when it comes down to looking defeat in the face, I wonder. In the Muslim world, this is Americans killing Muslims again, and it looks like it's for oil. He said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan.
they seem to be meddling and there are already indications of that look at the British British having sent an SAS team and uh, MI6 agents into Libya David Cameron has been accused by uh, some people within the government of trying to orchestrate regime change across the Arab world is this something that you agree with of course with uh, with France of course it's very obvious it's very obvious. Has Gaddafi used the oil money to build Libya? Yes. Did Gaddafi use oil money and discover water under the Sahara Desert and brought that water to the surface and brought water from Benghazi all the way uh, to the border almost of Tunisia? Did he impose farming in the desert so that they could feed their own people? Yes. Are there billions of dollars that he's spending building homes, building apartments for his people? Yes. So something is under this. And so when America, England, France, three imperialist powers want to destabilize that country, is it that you so concerned? You are hearing rumors, false reports. Please take your camera tomorrow morning, even this night. Go, uh, go to uh, every city in Libya. Everything is calm, everything is peaceful. The point is there is a big, big gap between reality and the media reports. So is the unbalanced nature of the coverage. Rather than being impartial observers, some networks stop short of directing the protesters. But here, the Al Jazeera crew is warming up the crowd in time for their next live report. Footage we see on American and British channels looks fake. They create an illusion of military action. Where are the aircraft? Where are the bomb raids? Where is the destruction and casualties we hear so much about? If all that is true, evidence should now be on the table in the Security Council. On both sides, the army and police on one, the insurgents on the other, only 150 to 200 people were killed. But it's claimed there were thousands. An attack on Muammar Gaddafi is an attack on Libya itself. It is treason. There is no uprising in the East, only a criminal enterprise by a few hundred gangsters. They are mystifying that the United Nations cannot see that. There's a constant refrain in this crowd. The people are happy, but Al Jazeera knows nothing. Well, the reports of Libya mobilizing its air force against its own people spread quickly around the world. But Russia's military chief says they've been monitoring from space. And the pictures tell a different story. According to Al Jazeera and to BBC, on the 22nd of February, uh, Libyan government has inflicted airstrikes on Benghazi, the biggest city in the country, and on Tripoli. And according to Russia's military, they have not registered any of those airstrikes. According to them, the pictures show that nothing of that sort has been going on the ground. Now, the tough new sanctions and Gaddafi's increasing isolation are based on allegations that he has ordered airstrikes, bombing of civilian protesters. We have seen no evidence of that yet and the Gaddafis strongly deny it. Are there any conditions under which you would support foreign military intervention in Libya? Facts, that's all. Only facts on the table of the UN Security Council saying that weapons were used against peaceful civilians in Libya. You know we told them, the British and the, 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 the French, we, we did challenge them. We told them, send fact-finding mission to Libya. The thing is, we don't have any facts. We have reports from the BBC, CNN and other media featuring some machine gunner firing his machine gun in the air. At the same time, we don't see any aircraft attacking. Instead, we see people applauding the gunner for looking so cool. If there were a real aircraft attack in progress, they wouldn't be applauding. The U.S. has reportedly asked Saudi Arabia if it can supply weapons to the rebels in Benghazi. The Saudis have been told that opponents of Gaddafi need anti-tank uh, rockets, mortars and ground-to-air missiles to shoot down Gaddafi's fighter bombers. We say we're concerned about things happening in Libya. Please note the following. The North African cell of Al-Qaeda is also concerned about what's happening in Libya. Do you think that's a coincidence? Army. Americans themselves have estimated that Libya, especially the eastern part of the country, which is where the rebels have reportedly gained control, is where is is home to a large number of jihadists. They make up a fifth of world jihadists. 
It's enough to say that one of the rebel leaders in northeast Benghazi was once Osama bin Laden's personal driver. The question here is whether the U.S. is going to end up putting weapons in the hands of radicals and destabilizing the region even more. Anti-Gaddafi rebels are growing more confident and are now focusing on capturing Tripoli. With God's will, we will win. We're going out today for this tyrant and Zionist. With God's will, it will be his last day. This man has been investing in African development. This man has been moving throughout Africa. This man has friends all over the world. He may not be your friend, but if you take him out and kill him like he's some rotten fella that wants to kill his own people, what did you do in Waco? What did you do when your people rose up? Did you talk them out of it? No, they had weapons, you bombed them. What did you do in Philadelphia with the move movement? Did you talk them out of their home or did you bomb them? Let, let, let me focus on initially the issue of Libya. Um, I want to talk about the substance of Libya because there's been all kinds of noise about process and congressional consultation and so forth. Let, let's talk about concretely what's happened. I spoke to the American people about what we would do. You also took an oath, remember? You solemnly swore to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear that I will execute the United office of States? President of the United States faithfully and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. You actually took it twice. Remember? You swore, you solemnly swore that to the best of your ability you would preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. I brought Hussein Obama to something this way. said I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. We have done exactly what I said we would do. Except, of course, the most important thing, your oath of office, where you solemnly swore to uphold the Constitution. And before the election, you told people that you would uphold it. You answered a question about this very thing, about presidential war powers. So, a lot of this uh, fuss is politics. Fuss, it's our Constitution. We were warned of exactly this abuse of power by the father of the Constitution. Madison wrote how the U.S. Constitution was deliberately designed to prevent the President from doing what Obama has done. In no part of the Constitution is more wisdom to be found than in the clause that confides the question of war or peace to the legislature and not to the executive department. Our Constitution was clearly written to prevent Obama from doing what he explicitly promised us he wouldn't do if we trusted him with the responsibility to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. And, and, and this suddenly becomes the, the cause celebre for some folks in Congress? Come on. This guy should be impeached. There's no legitimacy to allow a president to continue after he's done such a thing with the most important issue, the issue of war. And, and, and this suddenly becomes the, the cause celebre for some folks in Congress? Come on. He should be impeached if there was any justice in this country. He swore an oath to the Constitution and he violated that.
Just leave us alone. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to write. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. So, I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell.
shine on, making our faces many colors. Everyone is moving like waves, make an ocean on and on. Everybody's singing, yes, this is happiness, happiness. Everybody see me, this is how 